Welcome back everyone to another Kerbal Space Program 2 video and you know what guys, I think it's time that I build my first surface base in Kerbal Space Program 2. I've built a lot of these over the years in Kerbal Space Program 1. I've never done it in KSP2. Partly because I wasn't quite sure if I could really make an interesting one because we don't really have anything like science parts or um, or refinery parts or anything other than sort of crew cabins. But then I thought, to be honest, crew cabins sort of make up the bulk of KSP1 bases anyway. So let's go ahead and build something. Now I did consider building a modular surface base that kind of docks together and all that. But I still don't quite trust KSP2 docking ports. And I just wanted the video to, well, I wanted the ship for the video to be stable and easy to fly and reliable because I only have so much time in the week to make KSP2 videos, especially with my uh, increasingly regrettable idea of <laughs> aiming for two of these videos each week. So I don't have that much time. So I thought, let's just go. This is the uh, prototype. This is my first foray in interplanetary colonization in Kerbal Space Program 2. Let's start off tentatively and if this is a resounding success then maybe we can start building slightly more ambitious things. There really there probably isn't much I can do at the moment with colonies in KSP2 because we don't have colonies right the actual colony pieces but we don't really have anything like like that like the aforementioned refineries we don't have any science parts or anything like that but then again I suppose now the concept has been proven I could always kind of make a pseudo and we got there's like a uranium power plant piece that I've still not used but I could always add some sort of nuclear power plant there maybe as a separate building right because it's not a good idea for the couples to share the same living space as you know depleted uranium <laughs> uh, so there, there's lots of there's lots of avenues to explore maybe like a rover docking bay things like that all possibilities for future videos so consider this the first uh, of hopefully many great surface bases that can go on another planet or moon in Kerbal Space Program 2. Another reason I'm going for a monolithic surface base is because it's much easier to strut it all together. It's harder to strut, you know, docked things because you couldn't add struts when you're building it. But anyway, here we are launching. So yeah, as mentioned, I wanted to add lots of struts to this thing because Rockets in KSP2 are very wobbly, but as you can see, uh, this rocket is actually no exception. Despite my best efforts, the struts, they didn't do enough. We're really, really wobbling about. Uh, but I thought, I, I, I persevered, I was like, you know what? We can power through this, I'm skilled enough at this game. We can fly a wobbly rocket, but yeah, it's just, it's getting worse and worse and worse until we just reached a breaking point. There it goes. Yep. We've lost the flight. Uh, really, it's a real shame. Uh, wobbly rockets are a real problem. There is only really one acceptable circumstance where rockets can be wobbly. And that's when they're plushy! That's right, Laon Aerospace finally have our very own line of plushies. We teamed up with Makeship to bring you the B Rocket. With an astronaut that is absolutely not Cross. and won't watch you while you sleep, I'm told. Oh my god, where did he go? Ah! That's right, you can remove the astronaut from the rocket after landing thanks to our advanced adhesion technology. Exploring brave new worlds like stones, bins, nature. It's on sale right now for a mere $29.99 US dollars. And if you're a silver level Patreon member, you get a 10% discount. Go and buy using the link in the description or pinned comment, but be warned, it's only available for 16 more days and then it's gone forever. So this is the only chance you'll ever get to own one. Act fast. But it's not just the exquisite embroidery, the smooth curves, the velvet yet aerodynamic finish that should convince you to pre-order. We need to assemble a space army. The Kraken has sold over 235 units as of the time of me speaking. This is not a drill. We need to sell even more to squash the Kraken and keep the solar bear safe. And because the brave astronaut is flying a freaking rocket, he could travel anywhere in the world, which means worldwide shipping to all who choose to pick one up. Act now while you still can. And when the plushies start shipping and litter breaking into your homes, I'll be running a competition on my Discord server where you can post a photo of your rocket and astronaut landed somewhere, and whoever sends their astronaut to the coolest destination will win a free copy of Kerbal Space Program 2. So what are you waiting for? Click that link below. Plushy plugs and merchandise milking aside, here we are back on the launch pad with Mark II. 
more struts edition. Yeah, I added all those like structural beams all the way up. Beams? I added all those structural beams all the way up the side of the rocket, strutted them all together. Let's see if this works. And as you can see, we're off to a uh, much more stable start. There's not, it's, the rocket's not got that sort of oscillation. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, is it? There is still a bit of a wobble, but I mean, I'd be a fool to expect this to be completely rock solid given the, uh, the not aerodynamic at all shape of the upper stage. I couldn't really make a payload fairing around the payload for obvious reasons. It's very, very big. Uh, but I think regardless, this flies pretty well. Uh, the reason why it's shaking, really, ironically, is those are those stabilization wings at the bottom of the stack. They was they I I put those there to keep things stable, and they seem to be the cause of our oscillation right now. But again, if they weren't there, we'd almost certainly be pointing the wrong direction towards the ground, much like another rocket that launched this week that was teased in the plushie advert as well, uh, and that was of course the Starship orbital flight test. I guess I didn't even need to say what it was to this video's audience because A, hopefully you're probably all aware of Starship because I've been covering it for uh, like nearly two years now. Um, no, more than nearly three years now in Space This Week. I still think of Space This Week as being like a new series on this channel. But I guess it's been a, a bit of a long running, long standing thing at this point. Uh, but yeah, I've been talking about that launch for blimmin ages and it finally finally happened. But aside from space this week, the other reason that you might be aware that Starship finally launched is because I made a video yesterday of uh, uh, James May and Richard Hammond, aka Top Gear minus Jeremy, uh, launching Starship. I realized that the uh, the audio and some of the video for the Top Gear Reliant Robin space shuttle launch uh, synchronized very, very well with the Starship orbital flight test because the main problem with the Reliant Robin space shuttle is that it didn't separate from the uh, external fuel tank. And obviously the Starship orbital flight test, you know how that goes. Uh, here is an issue with my rocket. As you can see, it started flipping around. I couldn't get it to point forwards. Just cross-faded to a quick load, by the way. And I realized that I guess the orange fuel tank is not connected to the decoupler on the Rhino engine. It's just connected to the Rhino engine itself. So I deployed the decoupler and it didn't do anything. And when I staged, uh, there's there's no fuel, basically. So I don't know what happened. The, uh, the second stage of this rocket was just useless. I don't know exactly why this was, though, because I'm pretty sure I did connect the orange tanks to a decoupler. Maybe I placed them onto the engine plate node rather than the decoupler's node, but I thought the decoupler was placed onto the engine plate node. Or maybe I placed them onto the, the Rhino engine's node and then I attached the uh, orange tanks to the engine plate nodes. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but that's pro it's probably something along those lines. Either way, we didn't have a second stage to use on this rocket. Luckily, the swerve stage, our interplanetary transport stage, has enough Delta V to not only do the job of the second stage, but also do everything else it was designed to do. So it wasn't a biggie in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, unfortunately for our crew, I did not launch this at a Juno transfer window because I thought, hey, it'd be nice to kind of give, have an opportunity to talk to you guys about what a Juno transfer window is because I, I never do that on this channel. And hey, this is a one-way mission. They're never coming back home anyway, so what does it really matter that they're going to be orbiting Kerbin for a little while? So we're going to time warp around so that if you draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Duna, the angle that that line would form at the sun would be around 45 degrees. So there you can see me sort of eyeballing it there. It doesn't have to be dead on. It's not too bad. Duna's gravity well. It's not massive, but it's not that small either, so it's not too hard to get an encounter if you're a little bit off the exact uh, optimal transfer window. So now we are at a Juno transfer window. The next thing we need to do is create a maneuver plan. So you can see me making one. I tend to just sort of raise my apogee to sort of just beyond Juno's height, maybe around, I don't know, 12, uh, 1200 meters per second in terms of the delta V required for the burn. And then I just grasp the center of the maneuver plan and node, and then just swing it around and try and get those uh, separation markers as close as possible by eye. And there we are. We have an encounter with Juno. We will be needing to do a, uh, a mid-course correction burn to get our, uh, our 
uh, well, what's it called? Trajectory past Juna uh, on an equatorial plane. So I didn't really bother exploring how close our orbital line was going to Juna at this point. I was just happy that we were getting a Juna encounter because, of, again, of the aforementioned fact that we're going to need to do a mid-course correction burn regardless. And also because... Um, maybe it's maybe this is more of a problem in KSP one. It's not as bad in KSP two, but historically, uh, in KSP one and my general experience of KSP two is that what the maneuver planner says you're going to end up with when you do the burn, and then what you actually end up with when you do the burn, it's not always the same. So there's no point planning this precise maneuver plan that's like to the millimeter per second of delta V accuracy because then when you do the burn it's not going to be exactly what you plan so just going to go for a gross encounter with Juna we'll fine tune it later on but of course we now have our Juna encounter so now we're just going to go ahead and time warp to the point at which we have escaped Kerbin's sphere of influence and then we're going to go ahead and create another maneuver plan and uh, get our Juna encounter to be uh, a bit more desirable so here I am pulling on the normal node uh, just trying to get ourselves on a more or less equatorial pass. I'm not worried about it being perfect because, again, this is a one-way mission. I don't have to worry about, you know, landing and lander and getting it back to an orbiting mothership where it's a bit... bit it's not essential, but it's much easier if you're coming in equatorial because you haven't got to faff around on diagonal trajectories and all that. But I don't know, I think it's always just good practice to aim for equatorial orbits because it just makes you a bit more practiced for when you're doing a mission where it is more essential that you're on an equatorial orbit. Like my previously mentioned example of uh, a mission involving an Apollo style setup where you have a lander that goes down to the surface leaving a mothership in orbit and they need to go back up and redock with the mothership etc. Much easier all around if you're on an equatorial plane so may as well try and keep your skills up, try and keep practiced uh, at getting an encounter with planets and moons that puts you on an orbital trajectory that kind of sets you up around the equator and uh, that's, that's my story, that's my quick tip for KSP2 and that's the only tip you're gonna get aside from of course purchasing my plushie. Uh, that's the best tip of all. Um, I'm really proud of that plush actually. I'm really really happy with how it came out. I've got it sat on my desk right now and uh, yeah, I love it. I've already bought like more for myself uh, now that the campaign's gone live. But it is crowdfunded so it does need to sell like a certain number of it before it gets made. So yeah, if you guys want to check it out, I I'm really proud of it and that's that's that. I'm not going to shit it anymore. Here we are, as you can see, I've made another maneuver plan now that we've entered Duna's sphere of influence to circularize around Duna. It's not essential because Juno has an atmosphere. Oh, by the way, there's Ike. This is my first view of Ike in Kerbal Space Program 2. And look at those volcanoes. Those are rife for exploring, I think, in a future video. Um, that I've got, I've got some ideas for an Ike mission, don't worry. But right now, the focus is going to be Juno. And, uh, yeah, it looks like, a, looks, like a, looks like a big old piece of pepperoni, doesn't it? Uh, maybe that's a sign that I'm a bit hungry. I'm a bit... Once again, guys, I recorded this video. Uh, I recorded this video quite late on. It's Friday for me. I wanted this video to come out on Saturday. So today for you guys, tomorrow for me. I'm like way behind you guys. Uh, but I procrastinated making this video. Like I, I filmed it all. I slapped it in my video editing software. And then I thought, hey, wouldn't it be funny to make a Top Gear launches Starship video? So then I spent like 20 minutes making that. And then I was watching it and reading the comments, and I ended up procrastinating like an hour and a half with that video. And ironically, I'm going to just refresh my YouTube Studio channel dash dashboard page. Because, like, I, I didn't really spend that long making it. It was a bit of a, a poop post. That's my safe for work language thing. <laughs> and uh, it's doing better than, like, any video I've made in the past two weeks. It's not quite as much as my... Um, KSP2, we just learned a lot of new information video where I covered Nate Simpson's Discord AMA. But aside from that, it's doing way better than any of my other uploads. So, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's not really a sustainable kind of video. I can't do that sort of thing all the time because it's, uh, it's an art, you know? But, yeah, it's just funny. I'm not complaining, by the way. Thank you, everyone, for watching my videos. Keep watching them. I'm not going to complain about one video doing well, of course. Uh, by the way, I should apologize. You might have noticed already, but there's no sound anymore. For some reason, the sound sort of stopped recording not long after getting this thing to low curb in orbit. So for the rest of the mission, well, it's happening now. And as you can see now, the parachute's deployed, but there's no sound effects, which is a real shame because the parachutes and the atmospheric uh, wind, the atmospheric wind, good 
good wording right there. The sound of the wind whipping past the parachutes is a really nice sound effect in Couple Space Room 2, so it's a real shame I can't showcase it. But again, maybe there's a good reason to build another surface base further down the line. Again, this is really just an experiment. Uh, I didn't want to have to faff around with docking ports because of the wobbliness and the unreliability. Even though patch 2 is out and the game is, you know, more reliable than ever, I'm still, you know, I'm still test I'm still testing the water. Uh, no water here though, this is a desert as we touch down on the sandy surface. Bit laggy there for you guys. I had to edit that right down. The whole, like, when it touched down, it froze several times. The entire touchdown sequence took about two minutes, which doesn't sound like that long, I guess. But it was two minutes of me just staring at the screen thinking, either this is going to unfreeze and it's going to be fine, or it's going to unfreeze and Jebediah Kerman will be dead. You know? <laughs> so luckily it was the former. Here you can see me detaching our landing stage, because I don't like having landing engines attached to surface bases. It looks a bit ugly. But there we are. About to crash into the surface, I then paused, switched to the surface base, so we can watch from a distance. There we are. And now it is time to uh, do that again with the other one. But as you can see, we weren't starting off vertical, so I thought maybe we could slide and then flip ourselves into a launch, and it did not work. So now there will forever be debris on the surface of Juna. Luckily, I make a new campaign for every single mission I do in KSP2 at the moment because it's just easier when managing quick saves and, you know, it's good to have a separate save for each video so I can just quickly go back and grab reference images and stuff if I need to make a thumbnail and I've got no usable shots in the video captures. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, here we are on the surface of Juna and I think this base turned out really well. It's not a complicated design, keeping it simple at the moment with KSP2, knowing how, you know, KSP2 is. And there's Valentina Kerman. An upside of me using the, a new campaign with each mission is that we can use the big important Kerbals that are objectively better than all the others. And that is, you know, the main... Oh, there's, no, there's, the, there's the main five now in case, but isn't there? Because there's Tim C. Kerman in addition to Jebediah, Bill, Bob and Val. And I think Jebediah, in fact, might be absent from this mission. So I guess I was incorrect by saying that if the craft blew up, Jebediah would be dead. But then again... The Kraken in KSP2 is all-powerful. Who knows, you know, how far its, 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 its powers reach. But there is the crew of our, um, of our colony. All happy and content, ready to live out the rest of their days on the surface of Juna. You are welcome, guys. Uh, I love that little shot just there. I wanted to just make sure that the ladders and all that worked because as far as my testing is gone, you can't actually use the EVA pack on Juna anymore. It doesn't have a high enough thrust to get you off the surface. So it's imperative that the ladders work and the couples could board the station okay. And as you can see, we could reach not only the lower doors, but also the upper doors. So I was happy with the ladder design and I'm happy with the base design as well. As we do a little awkward pan around, we can't pan around and like spin around vessels anymore with the arrow keys in KSP2, so instead I just set my mouse's DPI really low and then tried to manually pan around and I don't know how it came out, you guys will let me know. But I think that's as good a place as any to end the video, so I'm going to give a massive thank you now to all of my Patreon supporters and members of the channel that help make all of this content possible. And there's some video suggestions on the screen that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. And yeah, if you want to support me on Patreon, there is a link to that, to that on the screen. A subscribe button as well. And again, if you want to buy the plushie, get a discount if you're a silver member Patreon. Uh, DM me on Patreon if you haven't received your code, but you should have. Uh, so yeah, that's everything. Bye!